All right, and just for our attendees, we're gonna give it about one more minute in case we have a couple of people trying to join late through the Zoom link, so just hold tight. All right, it's about 9.01. We'll go ahead and get the meeting started. Just in means of introduction, my name is Angela Foose. I'm the Assistant Director here with the City of Reno Development Services. Also joining me, we have Grace and Lauren. I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. My name is Grace Mackinnon. I'm a Senior Management Analyst for Development Services. And my name is Lauren Knox. I'm a Senior Planner with Development Services. Great. So we are holding a series of virtual stakeholder meetings. This is anyone in the community that wants to be involved and kind of hear about some of the initiatives we're working on. We, um, for the past probably eight or nine months, have been putting together a list of different housing and affordability initiatives. And so we started by going to council back in November and December. Um, did some stakeholder meetings, then went to our planning commission, got some additional input. So before we go back to city council with any kind of formal recommendation, we wanted to bring it back out to the public to make sure you guys um, had a, an opportunity to provide feedback and input. And so for today's presentation, we will have about 30 minutes of presentation, and then we'll open it up to questions. For those of you that, that want to stick around for the questions, great. You're welcome to do that, but for those of you that need to leave after the presentation, we just wanted to give you that ability to hear what we're doing and then leave. Um, we also encourage you to put any questions in the chat. And so once we're done with the formal presentation, we'll then go to that chat um, and go through that questions. We'll also um, bring you in so you can ask questions if you're not comfortable typing in the chat. Okay, so with that, I'm going to share my screen and we will kick it off. All right, so to begin with, um, question of what, why is the city of Reno really moving this initiative forward? And there's, there's kind of two topics. One is housing in terms of the supply of housing. And then the second one is affordability. So when we talk about affordability, we really are talking about those um, apartment projects that have some kind of subsidized funding, whether that subsidy came from HUD or the federal or the state government. So kind of two different branches um, really of housing and affordability. For the last couple of years, the city council has really tried to um, push for some initiatives to help with the affordability piece. So what we're talking about today is strictly related to the zoning code. Um, we've had people ask, well, what are we doing about, um, you know, rent control and some of those types of things, because we don't have control over any of that as part of the zoning um, administration that we do. This, this discussion is strictly related to what can we do from a zoning perspective to help with housing and affordability. So um, on the topic of, of affordability specifically, one thing that came out of this last legislative session was Assembly Bill 213. And not everyone realizes this, but our assembly, our state assembly meets every other year. And so um, they just met, they finished their session. It's about a six month time frame when they actually meet. So it's a very tight window, but housing and affordability was one of the top topics that was discussed with this last legislative session. So this Assembly Bill 213, does have some significant impacts and some timelines that we have to meet. So one of the things that came out of that was that local jurisdictions shall enact an ordinance, meaning we actually have to adopt something specifically related to affordable housing. So there's two things we have to accomplish with that ordinance. One is provide some kind of expedited review process specific to affordable housing. And then the second is provide some incentives specifically related to affordable housing. And they kept it, the state legislature kept it pretty broad. They didn't mandate specifically how we address that. So we have a, a couple suggestions that we're proposing again to our planning commission and city council. Um, we're also working on some other things. One topic that's come up quite a bit is ADUs or accessory dwelling units. We call it kind of granny flats. 
Um, we are currently separately working on an ordinance to adopt accessory dwelling units. We're going to be going back to City Council in May to discuss um, kind of high level how they want to see that ordinance crafted. And then we'll go out to the public in a couple of months and do more of a stakeholder input. So you guys, again, if you're interested, will have an opportunity to talk about ADUs. But specific to today, um, we're just talking about some very um, tight things uh, on the topic of both affordability and housing supply. So when we started out as staff looking at, well, how do we adopt some ordinances related to affordability and, and housing in general? We said, well, what, what's the rest of the country doing? You know, this housing crisis that we're having is not unique to Reno, nor is it unique to Nevada. This is something across the whole nation local jurisdictions are grappling with. And it's everything from rents are high, supply is low, how are people that are still trying to make ends meet able to support, you know, making 30% of their income go, to, go towards housing and, and how are people just functioning in general? So we looked at what other communities are doing and we tried to come up with something that maybe fit better for Reno. We wanted to be cognizant that we didn't wanna put some suggestions out there that were a little too extreme. Um, you know, for maybe this community, we also wanted to be sure that we were protecting existing neighborhoods. One of the big concerns we've heard over and over again is, you know, I moved to Reno for a reason. I like the Reno I moved into. Don't make a bunch of changes. So what are things that we can do, again, to support what the legislature has asked us to do, um, support the, the, the individuals that need a place to live? You know, if you can't afford a mortgage, are you able to afford rent? A lot of times rent is actually higher than mortgage. Um, so, you know, what, what can we as, as local jurisdictions do to help ease some of that pain? So we looked again at what local jurisdictions, jurisdictions across the board are doing, and we came up with some ideas. So we have kind of two categories. This first category is a couple slides, but it's specific to affordable housing. So this isn't just market rate housing. You have to show that you actually have an affordable component, meaning you are subsidizing the rents through affordable housing um, you know, whether it's, again, through HUD or through state or federal funding, you have to show that there's affordability components specific to that topic. Here's two things we're pros proposing to do. So the first one is in trying to expedite review, we came up with two ideas. Uh, a, a lot of our apartment projects, just in general, require some kind of entitlement, and that means they require some additional level of review before they can even apply for a building permit. Some of those are just a staff review, and it goes through a couple of months of us reviewing something, providing comments. Um, others are a formal planning commission review. Sometimes it goes all the way up to a city council review. So all those additional timelines add time and expense. And so again, in trying to come up with some ideas to expedite um, projects, affordable housing projects getting to market, we proposed some language that said any project that meets that affordability of 60% of your area median income, so basically you know, you're subsidizing this project, um, would be able to go straight to a building permit. So they would be able to circumvent that, that longer public review process. One thing we, we um, wanted to let people know is this doesn't mean you can build affordable housing projects anywhere. You still have to have zoning that allows for apartments and you still have to meet all your other requirements. So you have to meet you know, parking requirements and height requirements and building setback requirements. All of those things still have to be met, but we would then allow you to go straight to a building permit and not have to go through that extra time and expense associated with some kind of entitlement. The second one is once you get to a building permit, we would assign a staff liaison, so just somebody in-house um, already that works for the city of Reno to help process that project through the building permit review. City of Reno has a fairly quick building permit review process compared to a lot of other places. Um, but what we find is a lot of times um, you submit for your building permit and it goes through all our different levels of reviews. The fire department looks at it and the building department, planning staff, engineering staff, the health department. So there's a lot of feedback that comes back. So basically we would kind of hold your hand as the developer of this affordable housing project, make sure you understand all the things that have to be changed and work with you to help just process that faster through the building permit review process. Again, you don't get to circumvent any codes or requirements. We would just help you to make sure you understand what changes need to be in place. And just generally speaking, so you guys understand too, we as, as a city don't get a ton of affordable housing projects. When we go back and we look at even like the last 20 years of how many projects have come in 
that meet that affordability requirement, generally we get two to three projects a year. And that's that's kind of been consistent for the last couple of decades. Um, so just understand that, you know, I don't anticipate any of these rules to really bring forth um, that many more projects. There's only so much funding to go around, but our, our goal is to help get them to market faster. Okay, so we took these two ideas to our planning commission and we asked for their input. And they said, these are great. We support these. And we also feel that you guys should go a step further in helping to do more for affordable housing. So here's three things that our planning commission also recommended um, specific to affordable housing. Number one, we do have limitations on how tall your building can be. So let's just hypothetically say you're in a zoning district that allows you to build a building that's three stories tall. Planning Commission recommended that we allow you to go two stories taller. So whatever the, the zoning district is sets the, the limits on how tall your building can be. Um, they propose that we allow it to go two stories. Just as an example, here's an existing affordable housing project that's three stories. That one's built today. We did a Photoshop um, to show you what an additional two stories could look like, just so you can visualize what's the difference between a two-story building and an additional, uh, I'm sorry, a three-story building with an additional two stories. So that was one thing. Second thing they said is, let's eliminate any requirements related to setbacks. And so your setbacks is basically how far your building has to be from a property line. And generally speaking, again, it depends on which zoning district you're building in, but typically like your side setback is anywhere from five to 10 feet. So planning commission said, um, let's, let's reduce that requirement and allow you to come in without having to meet any specific building setback requirement. So you would be able to go straight to a building permit, would not have to ask for any kind of variance or deviation uh, on your building setbacks. And then the third one, again, specific to affordable housing was parking. And they, they recommended that if you are doing an affordable housing project that meets that at least that criteria of 60% area median income, that you would be able to have no parking. Um, so you could put more units then um, in, in place of parking was the idea. So. Again, three things that Planning Commission recommended. Some questions we have gotten from the public is how do we guarantee that once a project comes in and, and gets these you know, additional uh, allowances, how do we guarantee that they stay affordable? Um, we do have some regulations that require that for 20 years, they have to meet that 60% affordability. So they're locked in for 20 years, it's deed restricted. It doesn't matter who buys or sells the property, it runs with the land for 20 years so that we are guaranteed that they meet that affordability. And again, anything that has government funding subsidies, whether it's HUD or the local um, government or state or federal, they have to, on an annual basis, do some reporting. So they have to show what their rents are. So again, we have a good checks and balances to address all those affordability requirements. Okay, the second thing that we propose to staff is tied to our density bonus. Now in every zoning district, they kind of limit how much density you can have. So as an example, let's say you had a, a zoning district called MF30. That means multifamily, 30 units per acre. So you're capped at no more than 30 units per acre. With this density bonus, you'd be able to add some additional units um, we have this in code already. So this is something that's been in place for a number of years that basically, if you provide more affordable units, we allow you to have more density. You still have to meet all your requirements of your parking and your setbacks and your building height. So that again is currently in code. The, the way it's in code now is you're capped. You can't have more than 45% density bonus. So just as an example, let's say you're on a small site and you're allowed to have 10 apartment units and these are all affordable. With the current code, the way it's written now, you would be able to do an additional 45% as long as you provide some affordability. So that would get you an additional four units. If you're allowed to have 10, that additional four would get you up to 14 units. Um, we, we found that over the years, not a lot of affordable housing projects use this density bonus. In fact, in the last three years, we've had one additional unit, so literally one unit one additional affordable housing unit has been approved using this density bonus. And so we said, well, that, that probably is really not doing a whole lot right now. So let's increase that. So what we proposed is again, if you are meeting that 60% um, of your area median income, we propose that you would have unlimited density. So you can go as many units as you can fit. Keep in mind, you are still capped at all the zoning requirements. So you're still capped at 
um, you know, the building height and the setbacks and all those other things. And again, that was staff's proposal. The second thing that we look to add is right now, we don't have any incentives for projects that meet an affordability in that 61 to 121% area median income. That's what we call more of your workforce housing. And we looked at state law and they actually kind of break down different workforce housing categories. And we said, well, to be in better conformance with state law, we should also look at you know, 80% of your area median income and 120% of your area median income. That's kind of best practices for affordability across the board. And again, because state law allows affordability at those, those kind of different breakdowns, we said we should probably also out, add some incentives. So we've added the ability to have density bonus if you provide that workforce housing anywhere between 61% of the area median income up to 120%. So we took that to Planning Commission, they agreed, and they didn't have any changes. So on the density bonus piece, again, Planning Commission supported staff and did not have any changes. Okay, so those are the, the two slides that we wanted to talk about specific to affordable housing. Separate from that, we're also looking at just housing supply. So these next few ideas are things that, um, again, staff and Planning Commission threw out there specific to increasing housing supply. Now, we want to also just bring to light that so supply is one thing, but where it's located is another. You know, as a region, Reno, Sparks, Washoe County, we've gotten together and we've all talked about, you know, where do we want to see growth? And we have this separate agency called the Truckee Meadows Regional Planning Agency. And they have for the last, gosh, 30 years, probably 40 years now, um, looked at as a region, how do we want to grow and where do we want to grow? So we're really trying to focus more on infill, you know, areas that are already developed, areas where we already have schools and areas where we have um, sidewalks and stores and um, housing and, and these things that are already in place. So the specific to this next kind of section of slides is it has nothing to do with affordable, uh, the affordability. It's strictly just trying to increase the housing supply. Okay. So within that um, density bonus, again, you don't have to have any affordability component. We're not looking at the, the price of what you're charging for rents, but we're looking at things that we can do to increase supply of housing specific to these infill areas. So our current zoning code already has a density bonus just for these market rate apartments. And it's based on the smaller the unit, the more options we give you to add density. So here's what it is today. We have these three different categories units that are 1,000 square feet, units that are 1,400 square feet, and units that are 1,800 square feet. So these are those three different categories. We currently allow a density bonus. At the max, the most you can get would be an additional 45%. Again, as a great example, let's assume you have a small site. Let's assume you can build 10 units just based on what the zoning limits you to. With this density bonus, you could add another four units if you have these smaller 1,000 square foot units or less. We, we, we've seen this used over the last three years. We've had about 12 projects total um, that have used this density bonus. So that's been great. We've, we've, able, we've been able to bring more housing to market. And um, just big picture, we've added about 60 additional apartment units in three years. So we're, we're not seeing a huge um, influx of apartments that use this density bonus. But again, if there's things we can incrementally do, um, that's what we're lo looking for. So on those smaller units, 1,000 square feet, the max right now you can do is an additional 45%. We're proposing to increase that to get you 80% density bonus. So again, go back to our example. Let's say you can have 10 units. With the proposed language, you'd be able to add eight units. So instead of 10 units, you'd have 18 units and so forth. So we wanted to give you some examples of how that's been used in the past, just so you can better understand what that might look like. Here's one example of a, a motel. This was a Motel 6 that had 124 motel rooms. And so we had a developer come in and they wanted to convert it to housing, which is great. We love the idea of taking existing uh, an existing building um, and just reapplying it, um, kind of reuse or conversion of what we have already. And so because the zoning limited the number of units to 88 ho um, housing units or apartment units, they were gonna have all this excess, uh, basically 36 motel rooms that they weren't gonna be able to convert into anything. But through the existing zoning code, that density bonus, they were able to add an additional 36. 
all of that was already in contained within the building itself. So they didn't have to add any square footage. They basically took all 124 motel rooms and converted them into actual residential units. So they added kitchens, cleaned them up, um, and made them living spaces. So again, this is a great example of how we currently have been able to use the, the, the density bonus. Another example is we had a brand new project. This was a, an infill project over off of Wells Avenue. And through the zoning, they were capped at only being able to provide 16 units. So it's a small site, um, small project, 16 units. We love to see, you know, again, some of this new development come in and help to kind of gentrify some of these, these older neighborhoods. They still have to provide all the parking and the landscaping and all the fire codes and everything else has to be met. But through that density bonus, they were able to add an additional two units. Not significant in terms of, of increasing the housing supply, but really to go from 16 units to 18 units in an infill area is ideally um, you know, what we're shooting for and trying to increase density, but in, in a small incremental way. All right, so our, our next kind of bigger category has to do with development by right. So depending on what your property is zoned and how many units you're proposing, sometimes you can go straight to a building permit and sometimes you have to go through a, an entitlement process, again, adding cost and time um, to your project. So we looked at our zoning code and we compared it to other jurisdictions. We said, well, how does Sparks and Carson and Fernley and Henderson and Clark County, how do they all deal with development by right? And generally speaking, most jurisdictions use the threshold of anything more than 100 units goes through a public hearing process. Anything less than 100 units would go to straight to a building permit, so by right. And so we looked at our zoning code and we have about um, six different zoning districts where we limit the ability to move forward with development um, unless you have to go through that entitlement. So these are specific to these six zoning categories, all of our multifamily, the MF14, MF21, and MF30. Right now, if you have more than 20 units, you have to go through this entitlement process. Um, our NC and GCs are commercial categories. And then that PO is our office, professional office. So you're allowed to have apartments in all of these zoning categories, but you're required to go through an additional entitlement if you have more than 20 and less than 100. So we said, let's change that. So um, what we're proposing was anything less than 100 units specific to these zoning categories would be able to go straight to a building permit. Anything more than 100 units would still have to go through our conditional use permit, which is a public hearing. Um, process and it does require planning commission review and approval. So that again, anything less than 100 in these zoning categories would go straight to a building permit. We wanted to give you some examples of a couple of projects that have had to go through that additional entitlement just so you could physically see what that looks like. Here's three examples that we've had. One of them is in Midtown. This is the Vesta Apartments. It's a great little project, 40 units. Um, it's four stories, so it has parking on the ground floor and three stories above that for residents. Um, the Orvada Apartments is there in the middle. That was an affordable housing project, small units, again, 40 units. And they did have to go through that additional entitlement because they had a zoning district that required anything less than 100 units to go through that additional entitlement. And then finally, the Grand Canyon, again, a small infill project. They just had 18 units and they still triggered that additional entitlement. So if this um, what we have po proposed was to be passed, these projects would have not had to go through that additional entitlement. And then our final category is what we call missing middle. Missing middle is a term, you, it's a kind of a buzz term. Um, we, we've heard it a lot in the news. It's basically, we have a lot of people that want to build apartments and we have a lot of developers that build single family but we don't have a lot of options for housing in between. And that's everything from, you know, a smaller, let's say a duplex or maybe a triplex, um, uh, townhomes and condos. There's, there's really more housing diversity in some of these other cities that maybe Reno doesn't have right now. So again, looking at across the nation, what are other communities doing? A lot of them are allowing duplex, triplex, fourplex in all single family zoning districts by right. So straight to a building permit allowed today. And we just wanted to give you some examples of what that could look like. I think a lot of people have this, this idea that a duplex in a single family neighborhood is gonna change the character 
of their neighborhood. So we wanted to show you just some examples of some other duplex, triplex, fourplex that we've seen um, that really are, are good looking projects that wouldn't negatively impact the character of a neighborhood. So from staff's perspective, we looked at where we allow duplex, triplex, and fourplex today. Um, and understanding we have four different single family zoning districts. We allow duplex, triplex, and fourplex in two of those today. We do require a conditional use permit, which is that public hearing process that goes to planning commission. So we propose to expand that, not, not just in those two um, single family zoning districts, but expand it to the other two. So these other two is what we call SF3 and SF5. And um, again, what we propose is allow duplex, triplex, fourplex in those additional two zoning districts, but with a public review process. Now, we took that to, um, we, we mapped that just so you could better understand where are these duplex triplexes allowed today and how would the proposed changes look on a map? So everything in green is where our zoning code today allows you to build duplex, triplex, and fourplex. It's a pretty big chunk of our city is where you can build them today. We don't see a ton of these. Um, so what we're proposing is everything in that yellow or orangish color those two different single family zoning districts, they, they would be added. Um, again, we as staff proposed it would still have to go through a public hearing process. Now we took that to our planning commission and they said, that's great, let's take it a step further. So their proposal, the change, was to allow duplex triplex in all of our single family zoning districts by right, meaning there would be no public review process. Um, just so you understand, again, how often do we see duplex, triplex, fourplex? In the last three years, we went back and we looked at how many building permits have submitted for a duplex. We've had 26 duplexes come forward in three years. And again, it's, it's pretty much allowed in many of our zoning districts today, but we've only had 26 actually come forward for a building permit. Same with our, our the, the triplex and the fourplex. We just don't see a ton of those. Triplex in the last three years, I think we've had 14 come forward with building permits. And the fourplex, which is the four units together, we've had 10 building permits come forward. So I don't anticipate that either the staff's change, uh, recommended change, or planning commission's recommended change will have a lot of impacts on this. But again, small incremental changes is what we're looking for. So... That encompasses, again, kind of the, the proposed changes, both to the affordable housing piece and to just the housing production and um, supply. But we did want to highlight that none of these changes have an impact on our other code requirements. So all of these projects, you'd still have to meet building code and fire code and zoning code requirements. Um, we've gotten a lot of feedback of, oh, does this mean I'm going to have market rate apartments built in, in my neighborhood? So keep in mind too that in single family neighborhoods, um, we have two zoning districts that today allow for apartments. We, we typically don't see apartments built in single family neighborhoods. And so this wouldn't impact that. Um, nothing would change from that perspective. If you can build apartments in your neighborhood today, you could still build apartments with this proposed change. Um, the one big thing though, is those, those affordable housing projects would be able to go forward without um, a public review, they would go straight to a building permit. Now you'd still have to be in a zoning district that allows for apartments. So this is not like a catch-all, you can build affordable housing wherever you want. You still have to meet all the code requirements that says, are apartments even allowed in that zoning district? So just keep that in, fresh in your mind as well. All right, in terms of next steps, um, like I said, we're holding these stakeholder meetings, trying to get more input from the community, and then we will be taking this to a city council hearing on May 8th. Um, at that meeting, they will be providing direction on which initiatives they want to move forward with. So we'll get feedback from the stakeholders. We definitely encourage you to reach out to your council members, either by email or phone. Um, we do have public comment forms you can fill out online. Things you like, things you don't like. The more input you give them, the better off they are, which is being educated. Um, and then they will provide staff with recommendations, and then we will turn that into a, an ordinance, and we'll move that forward, hopefully May, June, and probably July before anything is adopted. Okay, so that concludes our presentation. Um, we do have at least, looks like, one question, and again, we encourage everyone to use that chat box if you want to put in any questions for the group to see. Um, and then if you want to ask specific questions, we'll bring you over and you can say it out loud as well. 
Okay, so um, Allison, looks like do all units have to be affordable to get density bonus? So um, let me just go back to, I'm gonna do a shared screen still. We'll go back to that affordable housing slide. On the density bonus, you have to show that on average, um, all of your units meet 60% area median income. So in other words, we have people that say, hey, I've got 50 units and only one of them is gonna be affordable. Then no, you wouldn't get this density bonus. You have to be able to show that on average, you meet 60% AMI for all of your units. So we have some projects that come in that meet like they're at 80% AMI, and then they also have some mixed in with 40% AMI. So as long as overall they average 60%, then you would be eligible for that density bonus. All right, so I've got another one here from Carrie. It says, you stated that zoning codes would not be eliminated. However, it also said that setbacks would be eliminated in some cases. Isn't that contrary, contradictory? So from staff's recommendations, and these are things that we're taking forward to council, um, we propose that you still have to meet all of your zoning code requirements. Planning Commission, um, made a different recommendation. And their recommendation was that setbacks for affordable housing would not have to go through any entitlement review. So again, um, we'll take that feedback to, to city council and let them weigh in on how they feel about that. So kind of two different things. Staff's recommendation is you still have to meet all your code requirements. Planning commission said we should go a step further um, and allow deviations for building setbacks for affordable housing projects. And then also they propose that you can go an additional two stories if it's a, an affordable housing project. Um, next question, it looks like from Anne is, did we talk about ADU? So accessory dwelling units, we are doing a separate text amendment on ADUs. We'll be taking that to city council on May 8th to get some feedback on what those requirements should be. That's gonna look at everything from, you know, where should we allow accessory dwelling units? How many parking spaces should be required? How tall should ADUs be? So we'll take that information to city council, get their feedback, and then we're gonna hold a series of stakeholder meetings later this summer to talk about ADUs. Okay. Um, another one from Allison here. Are the projects then deed restricted? If so, I'm not sure this is going to make sense for anything except small motel conversions. So this is currently um, a code requirement. Anything that is affordable now is already deed restricted. Um, so it's something we currently do. And it's it, we, again, we've been doing it for 20 years. So you, you still have to meet that deed restricted affordability requirement. And that typically... I can't think of any project that has come forward that has not had some government subsidy that meets the affordability. I think, you know, there's a lot of people that say they want to, to provide affordable housing, but they're not locked in. So truly, unless they're willing to lock it in and guarantee it through a deed restriction, then they don't get these incentives. Um, and we've been doing this for, you know, 20 plus years. And so all of those projects that do get the subsidized government funding, they are required to lock in. HUD, I think, typically requires you to lock in for 30 years. And so um, there's other restrictions as well beyond just city. But from a zoning perspective, we require a 20-year a um, affordability lock-in. Okay. Um, and again, if you have questions and want to ask anything out loud, feel free to just wave your virtual hand and we can move you over into the chat. Okay, and it doesn't look like we have any. So oh, sorry, we have one more chat from Carrie. Oh, okay. All right. So it says, can you explain the zero to per 60%? Is it related to the AMI or percent of units? So Zero to 60% is that area median income. Typically, the, the, the majority of the affordable housing projects that we've seen historically are anywhere from like 45 to 60% of the area median income. We do have some that are able to provide really low um, subsidies, like at the 30%. I mean, that's basically people that have almost zero income. But for the most part, what we typically see is that 60% area median income. So again, you'd have to show that however many units you have that's in your project, they average 60% of the area median income. So you have to show that you're providing a subsidy for at least you know, the, 
averaging of overall the entire project has that 60%. So um, the idea is that you don't come in with one unit that provides a 60% area median income and everything else is market rate. You have to be able to show that depending on how many units you have, you average 60% of the area median income. And again, again, we get two to three affordable housing projects a year. So we've been able to, you know, kind of to, to track this fairly easily. So that's nothing that's um, drastically new. Um, but again, it's um, something I think that we're trying to promote. How do we help those projects get to market faster? And how do we help get even a couple more units on the market that provide that, that area median income? Hopefully that helped to explain it. Looks like Teresa has her hand up, so I'm going to move her over. Okay. All right, Tracy, you should be able to unmute. We can't hear you, so I'm not sure. It looks like you're unmuted. Still can't hear you. Yeah. you can Oh, I've sent, I go. sent the message. Yeah. I sent the message in the chat. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. So we do have another chat question. It's um, how, why are there so many apartments being built in South Reno? That That's a great question. One thing I forgot to add here is anything that's in a master plan community, such as a planned unit development, none of this would apply. Um, none of these changes would apply. When we have these, these plan unit developments, they're adopted with their own separate set of zoning standards. And so this does not affect any of those. So Somerset, as an example, is a planned unit development. Collin Ranch was developed back in the 80s as a planned unit development. This would not apply to them. The majority of South Meadows is all part of a planned unit development that was approved back in the 90s. Um, there's Damani, there's Double Diamond, there's South Meadows. So all of that was approved years ago. Um, and development has slowly started to come in. So a lot of that development was already planned for. And as developers are now, you know, markets are changing and maybe they didn't want to build apartments 20 years ago, but now they do. So that they are allowed by right because they got approved as a planned unit development a long time ago. Um, the other thing I don't think people realize is that we have a lot of zoning districts where you can do apartments by right. And this wouldn't change that. You'd still be able to do that but you also have unlimited density. So we, we actually have a huge swath of the city that allows for unlimited density, a lot that um, on our major corridors, such as like the South Virginia Street, we, we've seen a lot more apartments come up there. They're allowed by right to build apartments um, and they can, again, typically have unlimited density. So the areas where we see most of the impact of these changes would be outside of those areas. So not in a planned unit development, not in South Meadows, um, not on Virginia Street, because again, most of that is allowed by right. Just more of our infill areas, kind of these smaller pocket pieces is where we anticipate seeing um, most of these changes. Okay. Any other questions from the group? Well, we appreciate um, you guys providing questions and, and feedback. We definitely, like I said, encourage you to reach out to um, either us as staff in, in an email or your city council members. Let them know things that you support, things that you don't support. Um, I think the more input we can get from you know the residents of Reno, the better off our council will be to understand you know what the community wants and how they feel about just housing in general. So we definitely encourage you to provide public feedback to council um, on any of these topics. We do have one more stakeholder meeting this week, and then we will be presenting to city council on May 8th. So even if you're just interested in following along, feel free to watch the May 8th council meeting where we're going to talk about these housing initiatives. And then Grace is also going to talk to council about the ADU ordinance. So super exciting stuff. It's great to see so many ideas coming out. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to move some of these forward this summer. Okay. And with that, again, we appreciate everyone taking their time this morning and we hope to see you hopefully on May 8th or at future meetings. Thanks everyone.